There we are, un unmuted, and thank you for having me. I enjoy hearing all these uh, Bay Area names. So I lived in the Bay Area for quite a while <laughs> in Foster City. Anyway, let's go to share screen and uh, pick up this uh, PowerPoint. Oh, it works. Oh, yeah, it works. Well, at this point, can I have everybody mute yourself? Yes, everybody mute yourself. And I also recommend if you're seeing a, a series of thumbnails down the right side of your screen, go up to the top of there to the little black bar and to the little minus sign on the left end, click on it, it'll, it'll drop the thumbnails out so you can see the whole screen, because some of the PowerPoint slide information would be under that if it wasn't. So uh, go ahead and do that if you would. All right, let's begin this uh, slideshow. Oh, I've got that dang thing covered up here. Okay. Well, all right, let's go to slideshow from the beginning. There we are. All right, everybody seeing the title slide? Absolutely. All righty, thank you very much. Well, as you can see, this presentation was originally prepared for the ARRL Learning Network some time ago now, although this particular form of it has been added to or changed and improved quite a bit. It all resulted from an article I wrote back in QST back in February 21, one of my latest articles. I'm up to 23 now, I think. <laughs> and you can, uh, and there are my contact points if any of you want uh, to make contact with me. I'll be glad to uh, talk to you about it. And you can get it there with the QR code if you like. So that's why it's under the ARRL wrapper here. So what will you learn tonight? Well, we're going to talk about the primary purpose of a ballot. Some of you may be saying, oh, I know what that is. Well, are you sure you know what it is? Because I stood up at a radio club meeting here recently and I asked for a show of hands. And I asked the simple question, what is the primary purpose of a ballot? I got a lot of people answering, but very few of them gave anything like the correct answer. Most of them gave the pat answer, which we'll talk about, which doesn't tell you anything, or as the British say, bloody nothing about what a ballot does. So we're going to take a look at it from what it really does. Also, where do you want to locate a ballot? Now you might say, again, this sounds like a, a no-brainer a no question. No, it's not. You'll be surprised how many emails I get from people asking, well, where do I put a ballot? And because uh, uh, there, there is some question about this. Does it go at the antenna? Does it go in the middle of the feed line? Does it go at your shack? Where does it go? Well, this is not a question that a lot of people can answer knowledgeable, maybe by experience they do. But one of the things that many hams don't know about is how much ballon do you need? And they don't have any idea. They just either buy one or wrap a whole bunch of coax around a piece of PVC and hope that it'll work. So we want to talk about how do you design your own coiled coax balance. That's what they're correctly called, sometimes called ugly balance. Now, almost any ham that's been around for a while, particularly uh, the DX crowd, <laughs> You'll probably have beams and so forth. Uh, I don't have a beam up here, I can't, but um, are aware of the ugly ballon. Here's a picture of one hanging up on a multi-element beam made out of some RG8 wrapped around a piece of PVC. But most hams who use these probably just take a cookbook out of the internet and don't know why it's that many turns or that big. Well, I'm gonna show you how to figure it out. It's really a piece of cake or a piece of coax, maybe we should say. <laughs> We're gonna talk about how do you select the coil form? What kind of a form do you use? What determines the number of turns on that coil? How big in diameter should the coil be? And how long should it be? Now, like I say, a lot of people just grab a bunch of coax and wrap it on PVC, but they don't know whether they're doing it correctly or not. And that's what we wanna show you how to do tonight. All right. Here are the actual forms 
that a ballon takes or a coax ballon takes or an ugly ballon. On the upper left is the classical familiar one. Now, by the way, these are all two meter ballons. Uh, the principle is the same for an HF ballon or whatever. These are all little two meter ballons because I write lots of two meter articles. And on the upper left is a PVC pipe ballon or coax ballon with a number of turns of coax here, RG uh, mini eight. Uh, wrapped around a piece of uh, three-quarter inch PVC. This one has some holes drilled through it, so it'll hold the turns, although you can use tie wraps if you want. Another popular form of the coax ballon is to just scramble wind it, as in the lower left, and hold it together with some zip ties. My favorite, and this is the one I really like, is the upper right, where you take and you make the same scramble wound coil, except you don't keep the, you don't do it as pancakes, you wrap the wire in and out of itself. You loop it over the top and bring it out back through the middle with each turn until you form what's called a torus knot, as you can see it there. The advantage, not only easy to do, it doesn't need anything to secure it. It holds itself. Also on the bottom right there, I'm a, I own a 3D printer, greatest tool I ever purchased in my life, uh, and love it, love it, love it. And I've printed a couple of little, this is just one of, this is the two meter version, a couple of little ballon forms. I can just plunk the wire on it, pull it up tight, and I've got a ballon. I've got a three, uh, a two meter, which is the one you see here, and a six meter version. I've never made a bigger one. I usually go to PVC for bigger, ugly ballons. By the way, if you want, if you want the STL files so you can print one of these your own, just send me an email. I'll be glad to send it to you. All right. Let's go into what I said, the concept number one. What is the primary purpose of a ballot? And if you're like most of the guys that I got the answers from at the radio club, they answered, oh, I know, it's to convert balanced to unbalanced. I said, yeah, that's true. But what in the heck does that mean? That's not a good answer. That, that covers up the answer of what these things do. The much better answer to what a ballon does, and I don't like the word ballon, I use a different name for them. The reason, primary reason for all ballons, choke off shield current, outside shield current, or if you want to put it in perhaps more technical terms, to eliminate common mode current. So I don't call these things ballons, although I'd use the term, of course, but I call them coax shield chokes. That's what the, the correct name for these devices. All right, let's understand why. Here's a piece of coax that we've cut in half with an X-Acto knife so we can look at it from the end. And you see the classic elements of it. The blue is the shield or the screen. The white is the dielectric, might be air or plastic. It's coax, it's usually plastic of some sort. And the red in the middle, which is uh, the center conductor. The, these are mostly copper, often silver plated and so forth to, uh, to work well. That's a typical uh, cross section of coax, but there's a lot more to it than that. Let's take a look at just the center conductor. We'll look at the shield here in a minute too. But skin effect plays a big part in what happens in coax. As we most hams know, skin effect is the tendency of RF or AC of any frequency not to run entirely uniformly through a conductor, but to migrate towards the edge. And the higher the frequency, the more it does it. So RF migrates towards the edge. So the current is only flowing in a skin on the edge of the inner conductor of coax. But let's look at the outer conductor now, the shield. Interestingly, because the shield has two sides, whereas the inner conductor only has one, the skin effect on the in the outside of the shield the current on the outside of the shield running is to make is to divide the shield into two separate wires this is all because of skin effect so current can flow on either side of the shield inside or outside and it can flow in different directions and be different values and this is all due to skin effect this is a principle not too commonly understood in the ham community so remember, coax is a three-conductor transmission line, and as such, 
is an unbalanced transmission line for that reason. It's that third conductor that makes it unbalanced. Okay, what's the upshot of this? Well, the upshot of this, as many of you already know, but we'll review. If you've got a dipole there, that vertical black line with the two arrows on it, uh, is the dipole, vertical dipole in this case. The current feeding it comes from the blue and the red conductors inside the coax. The red is coming from the outside of the center conductor, and the blue is coming from the inside of the outer conductor or the shield. But at the end of that coax is what we call a two to three wire transition because the skin uh, allows the current to flow around and to connect the green conductor and the blue conductor together. So the blue current that's coming back off the dipole, when it comes back there down the antenna, to go back down the antenna, does go down the inside of the coax on the inside of the, uh, of the shield, but it also flows down the outside of the coax as a thin skin on the outside. This is the reason for the essence of all balance is to stop this two to three wire transition. It's, and and uh, so remember, wherever coax ends, an open line of any kind or just two wire transmission line begins, there's a two to three wire transition. And that's what the ballon or the, or the coax shield choke is for to get rid of that second two to three wire transition. And it's not always at the antenna. It may be in many, several places if you do some conversions uh, in your feed system. All right. I like to analogize what coax does with this picture. Here's a simple plain wire dipole being fed with 600 ohm open wire line, a balanced system. Coax does what's symbolized here by the yellow line. It adds a third wire. It connects it to that to that left side. That would be the, the, the shield in the case if it were coax. It adds a third wire. What does that do for you? Nothing that you want. It'll do all three of the things there on the right. It can well increase the SWR in the system because that yellow wire is part of the radiating system, just like the dipole is part of the radiating system. The, the transmission line is not part of the radiating system. It's balanced out. But the, now with, with coax, you've got a three-wire antenna. And the SWR can easily be influenced by the, uh, that third wire. It can also put the tuning off. It can also put it on a different frequency. But the really big one that happens most of the time is that that third wire changes the radiation pattern. What would happen if you put up a three-wire dipole or tripole, I guess it would be? The radiation pattern wouldn't be the same as the dipole, would it? Well, that's what happens when you don't use a ballon to get rid of the two-wire to three-wire transition. Okay, well, I think you know, how do we eliminate these two to three-wire transitions? And believe me, there are more of them than one in most systems. Okay, this answer is quite simple. We insert a blockage, a roadblock, in the coax shield, in the outside of it. And we do that in one of two ways. We either just coil up some of that, that coax and make a, make a coil out of it, which has a reactance or an impedance to stop that current from flowing back down the outside at the two to three wire transition. Or we put ferrite sleeves and chokes on the outside to do the same thing. This is the primary job of a ballon. We say it's balanced to unbalanced. And yes, it's doing that, but that's a misnomer name as far as I'm concerned. I don't like the term balance. All right, here's the coax coil that we wind in the outside, which can just be a, just be a few turns of, of, of coax wound up in the feed line going up to the antenna. This is what makes up an ugly ballot. It has two properties to it. Of course, it has inductance, the outside there of the shield, forms a coil which has inductance or, in, and, or inductive reactance, if we want to use the proper term. But the shield also being next to itself for the in the turns also has interturn capacity. 
So the this coil of coax that we wind to stop the two to three wire transition has both inductance and capacitance. And in fact, it's a parallel tuned circuit at a given frequency. We'll come to it's come to that frequency here in a minute. So remember, when you wind a coil of coax in, in your in your feed line, you're creating a parallel tuned circuit to choke off the current flowing down the outside. This brings us to the subject of self resonance. Now, the blue line coming at an angle in this graph is the inductance. I mean, I'm sorry, the red line, the red line from the right is the inductance of the coil, the turns that you wrap in the coax. It uses that simple formula that you've probably all read in a radio book that the impedance of a coil is two pi times the frequency times the inductance. And, and, and the blue line coming in from the upper left is the distributed capacity or the capacity between the turns of that coil in the outside. And you'll notice that one particular frequency, those two cross each other and they are equal. That's the frequency of self resonance, at which point the, the, the blocking factor of this, of this coil on the outside increases. People ask me, is self resonance a bad thing? No, it just it just help it just blocks even more. So don't worry about self resonance. It's not a problem. Generally speaking, our ballon, as I'm showing here at the bottom, is working at a lower frequency than self resonance. But in case you're interested in knowing what the self resonance of your ballon is, you can you can find it at this website, which is there in the QR code at the right, if you want to take a picture of it for further reference. It's a little co uh, program I like, like to use called Coil 64. It's great for winding coils and so forth. Later on, I'm going to show you a 160 meter example. Uh, and when I ran this little calculator there on the 160 meter example, it had a resonant frequency of nearly 11 megahertz. For a 160 meter ballon, that's considerably above the ballon. Doesn't matter where the self resonance is, and it's not a problem, believe me. All right, there we've got through the technical stuff about balance. Now let's talk about where do we put it. I'm going to try to answer this question by asking you a question or two. All right, here's a nice fiberglass mast held up by some guy lines. And on the top of it is a simple wire dipole. I've duplicated the picture and replaced the open wire line on the left with coax on the right. So here's the same exact antenna being fed either with open wire line, so-called balanced line, which it is, and coax, so-called unbalanced line, because it has three conductors. Here's the question. Where does the ballon go in these two pictures? Does it belong at the top of both of them, or one of them, or neither of them? Or does it go at the bottom of the feed line where it hooks up to your radio? Or do we even need a ballon in some of these cases? Can you answer these four questions? If you can, then you're good at doing balance. Our bird in the window is chirping. Mute your mic. OK, let's answer the question here. Where is the two to three wire transition in these two pictures? Well, as, you, as some of you already know, if you're feeding a dipole with coax, it's right up at the antenna. So you have to put the ballon up there if you want it to really work right. But where is the two to three wire transition in the picture on the left? Some of you may not even think one exists. Oh, yes, it does. What is your rig? What is the what is the feed line coming from your rig to your tuner or whatever you're using to feed that that open wire line? Is that balanced line? No, it's not. It's coax. And there's where a two to three wire transition occurs. There's a two to three wire transition either at the top or the bottom of virtually every system. So you want to you, you want to understand where the two to three wire transition is. And there is one for open wire line. And by the way, while I'm here, don't use the ballon in your tuner. Uh, those are terrible ballons for uh, they're, they're voltage ballons and they're all sorts of trouble. I never use them. Okay, 
Now, the, to find out how to build an ugly ballon, a coax ballon, there's a two-step process. And the two steps are, you first have to figure out how much inductance do you need to do the choking. And then you have to work from the inductance and get the coil details, how big, how long, how many turns. It's a two-step process, and I'm going to show you doing both of them here. Okay, what's the starting point? Step one starts with the coax coil needs a minimum impedance if it wants to choke off that current. And the minimum standard practice for a ballot, this is a number to remember, is to have at least four times the reactance of the system you're working in. It's a 50 ohm system, you need 200 ohms. So generally speaking, for most ham installations, the minimum amount of inductance you need, the minimum system uh, if, against the system Z of 50 ohms is 200 ohms. Uh, you can use more. In fact, you can, more is not a problem, just as the self-inductance was, or self-resonance was not a problem. More inductance is not a problem. Lots of websites suggest more, although 200 ohms is sufficient. Well, now, once you know you need 200 ohms inductance or inductive reactance, uh, as, the, as it truly is, once you know you need that much impedance or inductive reactance, you can put it in to this formula. The inductive reactance of 200 ohms is 2 pi times the frequency, we'll be running 1.8 in the example, times the L. Or if you can do the simple math and just rearrange this equation, it comes down to this very simple formula that I think almost anybody can work. The amount of inductance you need for a 200 ohm impedance in the line is 31.8 divided by the frequency in megahertz. So how much inductance would we need at 10 megahertz at 30 meters? 31.8 microhenries. Very easy formula to work. All right, here's a little diagram that I created here, a little spreadsheet showing you what that, what that formula works out for all the bands, uh, 160 meters up through 10 meters. And you can see it's frequency dependent as the equation predicts. And anywhere from 17.7 microhenries needed at 160 for a minimum 200 ohm reactance ballon at to, at to 28 megahertz, we only need 1.1 microhenries to get a 200 ohm reactance ballon. So you need a, a smaller coil will obviously work at 10 meters and a bigger coil is necessary at 1.8. Some people automatically ask, can I use one coil for all of them? Yes, just make yourself a 160 meter ballon and use it for all bands. It works just fine. Okay, that's step number one. And by the way, if I back up here, by the way, notice the 17.7 microhenries. We're going to need that number for the for the 1.8 megahertz ballon or 160 meter ballon. Remember, 17.7. You'll see it come up here in a minute. Okay, now that you've got your 17.7 microhenries in, in this individual case or whatever it is, you now need to turn that 17 microhenries or whatever it is into the coil mechanics. That is, how many turns? How long should the coil be? What should the diameter be? These can vary a great deal because you can make ugly balance with more turns and smaller diameter, but you need to figure out which one you're going to use here. You see, you need an answer to these three questions. How many turns, how long, what diameter? You can usually decide for yourself what diameter you'd like or what length of coil you'd like or what number of turns you'd like and work the equation, uh, the whole calculator backwards. Now here's the math, uh, much too complicated. Yes, I can do math. I can certainly run through this equation. You can plug in the inductance. You can plug in the number of the coil radius and the coil number of turns and the coil length into this formula. And this will give you the inductance, the, uh, the uh, number of turns that you need. But I don't like to bother with it. I, there's so many good calculators on the internet that I you generally use them instead of working the math because I'm prone to make errors in math. Here's the calculator that I like. I'll leave this up for a few seconds here so that if you've got a cell phone cam camera and want to copy the QR code 
or just take a picture of the screen so you can look up this uh, particular URL. This is a great little calculator for taking inductance and turning it into the number of turns uh, of coax that you need, which you see down there at the bottom, number of turns, L. Uh, Translator Cafe, and that QR code will take you right there. And you can see it starts out by putting in the number of microhenries, and then you decide on how big a coil you want to use, and uh, then you have to put in the diameter of the shield without the insulation and the diameter of the coax with the insulation and push the button and it'll tell you, you need so many turns, so many centimeters long. All right, let's do an example. This 160 meter ballon, we're gonna build it out of RG8 uh, and we're gonna put it on PVC pipe, the good old classical ballon, uh, the ugly ballon. By the way, RG8, or LMR 400, if you want to get the flexible kind, or uh, RG 213, all 50 ohm, uh, uh, 4 tenths inch coax, 4.03 inches on the out, 0.403 inches on the outside. Not four, oh, that's the pipe, sorry. What am I saying? The pipe is four inch pipe. That's not at the bottom, I, I'm getting confused. The diameter of the coax is at the bottom, 0.403 inches, and the, and, since the, the insulation has little effect on it, we need the diameter of the actual shield. And for RG8, it's 0.38 inches. So remember those, remember these numbers, four inch form, four and a half inches in diameter, 17.7 microhenries, 0.38 inches uh, for the actual conductor and 0.403 for the total diameter, which determines the spacing uh, on the uh, coil. And here it is. Here's the ugly ballon for 160 meters. Uh, this is a, the literal one. And here you see, I've taken this calculator and I put in 17.7 microhenries, which we got from step one. I put in the diameter of the, of the form, which is four inch PVC, which is, has a four and a half inch outside diameter. I've put in the diameter of the shield without the insulation, which is 0.38 inches. And I've put in the diameter of the coax itself with the jacket, which is 0.403. And it's close wound. That's what this calculator is designed for, a close wound, ugly ballot. And by the way, if you, uh, that's my second operator. Sorry, hey, stop it. I'm, a, I'm probably getting a delivery. She hates the delivery man. <laughs> anyway, if you forget, one centimeter is 2.54 inches. And by the way, it was, it was recently standardized there in France, I think it was, at the International Association of Numerics or whatever, so that one inch equals 2.54 centimeters now exactly. It was agreed by definition. It used to be 2.54 plus a bunch of other decimals. Uh, 2.54 centimeters is now the agreed upon equivalent of one inch. And this particular uh, coil is 17.09445 centimeters long. And you can use that conversion there if you get it into inches. It's about 10 inches long, I think. And it has 16.7 turns, which if you want to count the picture, you'll see that's what that one is. And that's how you build an ugly ballon. There's nothing to it. It's a piece of cake. This calculator and one simple equation, and you're away. And, and can you use more? Of course. Can you use less? Yes, if you don't go down so low in frequency. Do you worry about the self-resonance? No. Uh, in fact, this is, the, this is the basic ugly ballon, which you saw there in the first, in the first slide. Works great. They're great ballons. So have some fun, build yourself some ugly ballons. They're a great deal of fun to make and they work very, very well. I use them on all antennas. I even put them on my commercial antennas, even if they supposedly don't need a ballon. Now, let's, as they say on television, pause for these important announcements. I'm gonna give you a, a shameless commercial for my slot antenna book, which some of you may already have but you can find it on Amazon eBooks. Just go to slotantennas.com or the 
Amazon and search for slotantennas.com. And there's the QR code. So that's it, folks. Ugly balance. They may be ugly, but they work fine. Well, thank you, John. That was a great presentation. Everybody, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it and learned a lot. Thank you for joining Thanks, us Jeff. this evening. And uh, you're welcome to stay around for the rest of the evening as we conduct our uh, as we conduct our business. And I'd like to start off with some officer reports. And we'll start off with our secretary, Lucas. All right. No questions for John? I'm surprised. Oh, I'm, wow. Talk about a goofy host. Please pardon me, Lucas. <laughs> Does anybody have questions for John? I've got a question. Uh, Go ahead, I, I think I'll, I, this is Henry, W6REK. Hey, I learned a lot, but um, I don't think I could explain to someone why the inside and the outside of the coax are not acting like one conductor because it's oh. two wires connected at both ends. It seems like Ohm's law would just split the current and they would act in concert. That yeah, your, your, your reasoning is logical, but it's not correct oh. because the, the, the wire is only a one piece of wire at DC, at AC or RF there is no current flowing down the middle. And so the current can easily flow. The skin effect limits the current on both sides of the, of the conductor. So it literally creates two separate, con it's just as if there was a, an insulator between the inside and the outside of a two-sided two conductor. Look at our Yaggies made of tubes, nothing inside. Nothing question, inside. Question for you, um, I got really frustrated with Buckmaster, uh, they like to, they sell a uh, uh, off center fed dipole. Uh -huh. They use a voltage ballon. I've talked to them about it over and over. Anyway, I ended up I, I put it up just like that, knowing better. I had RFI everywhere. There was just all kinds of currents on the outside of that coax. I went up with my wire cutters, cut it out, and put it in a current ballon and zip RFI. What you know? Have you ever worked with Buckmaster? Understand what's their argument? No, I have not worked with Buckmaster, and uh, they make some antennas that I don't care much for. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but um, but uh, I, I stay entirely away from voltage balance. They can be they can be made to work fine under certain limited circumstances, but uh, but uh, they 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 very frequently give you problems. Uh, so I stick strictly with current balance or coax balance or choke balance uh, because they're so universally good performers. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of antenna tuners that you buy will have a so-called balanced output. You know, they'll have a ceramic insulator on the outside for supposedly feeding long wires. And that's what they're, of course, uh, they, they do very often. But they often use voltage balance. And voltage balance, I, I can give you a whole talk on on voltage versus current balance, but uh, the voltage balance uh, is 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 a troublemaker. So I even if I've got one in my in my tuner, I bring it out of the two thirty nine jack and use a and use a choke a current choke balance instead. So uh, I, I don't I don't trust voltage balance. They can be made to work in some circumstances, but in many cases they're just asking for trouble, as uh, as as you uh, Bob have have seen. Supposedly they're cheap to make. Okay. Any other questions? Well, yeah, I know one of the things I've learned from John in, in the talks he's given at the. Uh, our satellite amateur radio club is that it's okay to have more than one ballon in the transmission line. And Absol John didn't mention absolutely. that. So. No, I've got, I, 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 this talk can go on very long as you can guess, but certainly you can put, you can put ballons any place you want to you can put one right outside your shack, put one in the middle. You can put one up at the top. It doesn't matter where the, where you put the choke <laughs> or how many chokes you have. You can have as many as you like. Okay, anybody else? Just a quick statement. 
Go ahead. I have never understood what was why you would need a bound because I've always seen the coax and the dipole as two wires. The graphic you showed with the outside and the inside of the coax lit the light bulb for me. Yeah, it's, it's a principle that a lot of hams don't understand. That division of the shield into two wires is, 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 is a mystery, but it's all because of skin effect. The skin depth, skin depth at RF is quite shallow. And most of that shield is not carrying any current. Good remark. Good remark. Anybody else? Okay. Well, John, thank you again for, for the making the presentation. Again, if you'd like, you're more than welcome to stay uh, for the rest of the meeting. We got a couple of uh, announcements, a little bit of business, and uh, afterwards we'll probably have a little bit more time to socialize. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll be leaving you now. It's been a pleasure, but have me back anytime. I'm willing to talk almost anytime. That's my favorite food. I'm a, I'm a natural instructor, and that's what I like to do. So, and I have lots of other talks I can give. So invite right. me back anytime. So I will hold you to the, that, John. All the best to you. And I got to show you my proper my proper show card here. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you, John. John. All the best. Stay safe, man.